I'm grateful to this rock that we're sitting on top. This beautiful rock called through a foil. It's so ancient. Grateful for the beauty of the geology of this rock. It's so old. I'm grateful to the people who lived on this rock before us. Many thousands of years ago. But yeah, also in the recent past, especially in the last six years. I'm grateful to all the people who've passed through and left something beautiful behind. So that's what we have here is yeah, so easy to be grateful for. Oh, a beautiful place. Grateful for all the trees and the birds and the lichen. Grateful to all the mammals yeah, and the otters and the, the whales and the dolphins and the human beings <laughs> in this ecosystem. Grateful to all the people that have taught me so much in the past. Grateful to all my teachers and grateful for all the mistakes that I've made so that I could learn. And grateful for you, Tyler, for having been here for the last two months. Grateful that it was so easy to live with you. And thank you for all that you've contributed to yeah, beautiful Rua Farm. Thank you. grateful for journeys and paths. I'm grateful for the path that led me here. Um, this was not the destination I knew I was looking for. And I just think of all the twists and turns that brought me here. I'm grateful that I arrived here safely. And I'm grateful also for your path. It's brought you here. Uh, all the twists and turns that I've had a little bit of a chance to learn about. Um, your uh, perseverance as well, and your courage to be here on this rock now, despite everything and because of everything. So I'm grateful for journeys and for paths. In July and August of 2022, I spent uh, all of my time on the permaculture community of Ruba Foil on the Isle of Skye, Scotland. I recorded this conversation between myself and Ludwig, the founder of Rubafoil, about two days before I left. It pretty much speaks for itself, so I'll just let it play. This is Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. Welcome. So, where are we? We are sitting in a polytunnel, which is located on top of a rock which is one billion year old and is sitting like a cherry on top of a cake, on top of a sheet of a rock, which is you know, the oldest rock in Europe. And this rock that we're sitting on top has gone through so much hardship that it's completely filled with fault lines and cracks. And I'm lucky enough to have been the legally owner and <laughs> the legal owner of this rock for the last six years. And I've made it into a center where people can come and learn those things that we will need in the near future with everything that's coming our way, which, you know, a bit of a trigger warning, scientists call uh, a clusterfuck. <laughs> um, and it's a small community. We're trying to create a small community where people can work together to create a beautiful team to recreate that community clan, tribe, structure that I have always felt missing in my life and what I see as essential to make any chance of any kind of positive lifestyle in the future. It's on the west coast of Scotland, as far away from Europe as you can possibly be without actually leaving Europe. <laughs> you so your your idea is to build a community here and you talked about passing on the the skills or the knowledge uh, the learning do you see this place as a refuge for people an education center how do you you know how do you frame it when you frame the vision of this place the vision itself is not that clearly defined what it's going to look like in the future because everything around us is changing and it's really difficult to predict what is actually going to be needed the most in the future. But the goal is to create a place where we can 
try and create the solution to the problem that has caused the clusterfuck right and the cause of the clusterfuck really is the culture and it's a culture of disconnection in the colonial world out there and what we're doing here is we're experimenting with creating a culture of connection instead because that's the seed that the solution needs to grow out of so this place is a place for experimentation and for adults to try and learn and make mistakes and grow and work together and trying to relearn what that's like to try and bring that back out of our dna what a connecting culture lo looks like in a small group of people working together with the goal and that's the goal of this, this this place here is that children are able to grow up in that connecting culture so that they become human beings who are connected so that they can pass that on to the next generation afterwards i feel like it's like a phoenix that we're trying to you know we're trying to create the egg where the phoenix is going to come out of when everything settles down eventually and i'm not saying that this is the phoenix it's one of the tens of thousands of them all around the world and the phoenix is the culture and the ashes that the phoenix will rise up out of will be the the remnants of the disconnecting culture if you like don't know if that's <laughs> yeah uh, i that that is something that really struck me when i got here that culturally there's something very different going on here um i've been traveling for about six months and what i thought i was doing was going around and helping people with their projects like diy projects you know as an engineer i can be pretty focused on uh building things designing things making things so with physical things and I've been interested in you know making things to grow food it's quite low down isn't it mm -hmm. yeah. at first I thought cat but maybe real hard maybe but yeah my first guess was a mammal as well like yeah. a cat or a mink yeah. sorry to interrupt <laughs> no i think that i think that was just jumping uh more to the question i was gonna ask <laughs> um I, uh, I i tend to think like oh let's build stuff you know I'm, i worked on an aquaponic system here and that was great that's the sort of thing that i thought was the main reason i came here um but it turns out that wasn't the main reason I came here um, you know I got here and within the first week we were modeling gratitude practice and you taught us how to do sit spots and fox walk and we started talking about bird language and so I have had a whole world opened up to me that I didn't really know existed a richness that I didn't know existed I kind of feel like I thought I was really into books this is a metaphor but I didn't know how to read I just thought the covers looked nice and I admired the binding. I was like, oh, this is a really well put together book, you know? And that was my attitude with, or my understanding, the level of my connection with nature. It feels like I was appreciating it aesthetically, which is fine, but I didn't understand the content of what was inside the book, inside of nature. And I feel like I'm far from understanding, but I now know that the squiggles uh, convey meaning <laughs> at some point. So, I mean, where to start? You talked about how the point of this place is to relearn how to build and maintain a connecting culture. What does listening to the birds have to do with <laughs> connecting culture? Yeah, that's a strange one, isn't it? <laughs> you need to walk me through that one. <laughs> it's not obvious right off the bat, is it? Yeah. Um, but it's actually really logical and, and easy. <laughs> I mean, I, as a human being, I grew up in a disconnecting culture and I can only teach you so much. It's much better for me to introduce you to the best teachers there are. And for us, from our perspective and our hearing capabilities and 
uh, from our senses, that's the birds. The birds are easy for us to see and hear, they're high up usually. And I often compare them like, you know, they're, they're mirrors for us. They communicate um, to us things about ourselves that we can learn from. Let me take you down <laughs> a path. Um, evolutionary speaking, when birds were dinosaurs, there in those days there was already a competition, a battle of evolution going on. Um, 60 million years ago when the, the birds started becoming formed. And <clears throat> the birds that are close, of, close to us have adopted a strategy of survival by becoming more and more aware and by cooperation, while the predator had to adapt continuously by becoming more stealthy and more surprising. And that co-evolution over the last millions and millions of years has resulted into a group of animals which are really aware of what was going on around them and they cooperate and they communicate with each other about that all the time. Imagine for instance, you know, if you're walking if you're hiking in, in the wilderness of Canada and you see a bear with your bunch of friends and the bear starts attacking you, you don't need to outrun the bear. You just need to outrun the slowest in your group. <laughs> That's how evolution works, that's how selection works, and it's the mm. same with birds. Mm. The least aware bird, the one that's not paying attention, gets ca gets caught by the sparrowhawk first. And the, the the reproduction system of the birds goes so fast. You know, the smaller birds become adults the next year already and have to, you know, make their own nests. So the evolution goes really quick and they've got about 10, 15 kids every year and only one of them needs to make, you know, make it to next year to reproduce itself, to keep the species going. The 14 other ones are selected out. So you've got this real specialization in awareness and communication going on. And the whole forest and the whole ecosystem around us listens to us. The only animal that's in that system that doesn't listen to that is our human beings, the colonized human beings. By relearning how to listen to those birds, a whole new world opens up, especially the bits that they reflect back to us because they talk about human beings quite a lot. And they talk about us when we're walking through the forest and by learning to understand what they are talking about, we learn a lot about us. And we love nature so much that we, when we learn that we're actually disrupting the forest so much by our disconnected behavior, we want to adapt our behavior because that's not what we want to achieve. So they continuously feed back to us when we're disconnected and they guide us into connection that way. And that's really easy because it's still in our DNA and their communication is really simple. It's just that we need to relearn to listen and to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And then we start learning a lot about what's going on around us too and our curiosity gets piqued and we start being curious about the stories that we heard. And now we're going to go and have a look and we're going to discover tracks in the, in the mud or in the soil and we're going to try and figure out what it was to see if our story is correct. And that leads us down a whole other hole <laughs> into discovering more about what's going on around us and then the birds keep reflecting it back to us and then we discover that we can ask the same questions about what's going on inside of us mm. and that's when we're going <laughs> in an even deeper hole <laughs> because we start discovering where we're wrong and where we make assumptions and we start discovering blind spots about ourselves and we start discovering where those blind spots came from and we start discovering that we've all been traumatized really deeply by that disconnecting culture out there and we start wanting to heal those traumas and we start healing each other's traumas by supporting each other and that's like a gate hole that we all need to walk through to be able to get that dis that disconnecting culture leave that behind us and step through that portal so we can wake that phoenix for ourselves and our own being and our own conditioning so we can redevelop that disconnecting culture because the two are not compatible you can't create a disconnecting, you can't create a connecting culture from within a disconnecting framework. So it's not even, it's not only easy to learn from the birds, this whole process, but I think it's also essential mm. almost to get through that process you know, without other external tricks. Of, and, and, you know, we need to be supported by that culture along the way because it's not an easy journey. 
you were born in a disconnecting culture. I was born in a disconnecting culture. Um, and it seems like a lot of what we're trying to do is learn how to connect. We have to learn it as adults. You and I are having to learn it as adults. When, when and how did your journey uh, to learning connecting culture begin? Or uh, more specifically, when did you... When did you learn to listen to the birds? When did you learn that they weren't just making random noises? Which, Because for me, I can pinpoint that as about two months ago <laughs> when you started talking about bird language and explaining some of the fundamentals to me, like baseline, alarm calls. I went, oh, they're talking about stuff and we can listen to a certain extent. When, what did that look like for you? Uh, yeah, I remember, I remember the moment that I, that it dawned on me that I was, when I was living in the forest, I lived in the forest pretty much on my own for four years in a tent that I made myself out of canvas and I had a wood burning stove with me. And I, yeah, I went there because I wanted to get rid of all that stuff that didn't serve me anymore. And I'd been an activist before and didn't really feel I was achieving what I needed to. And I kind of gave up on civilization and thought, you know, if you want to run off a cliff like a bunch of lemmings, on you go, you know, <laughs> I'm going to learn survival skills. And you know, it was my rejection of society at that time, which led me into the forest being on my own. And after a while, people started, you know, they'd heard about me and I was looking after the forest, you know, as a, as I wanted to, you know, I was trying to save an oak tree, spending a whole winter trying to pull trees out that were killing it. And other people had heard about me and started to come and help me once, you know, for a weekend sometimes or so. And I started noticing that the birds were behaving differently towards them than towards me. Mm. They were much more scared of them than they were of me, and I didn't really know what was going on until I noticed that the birds were reacting the way, the same way towards me as they would to the fox that was trotting along. We had a fox. I had a fox living in that forest, and he got quite used to this. You know, he came to sniff my plate once and gave me a bit of a look like, you know, "Oh, you bloody vegans!" <laughs> <laughs> you know, he. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I noticed that the birds were reacting the same way towards him when he was just trotting along uh, as towards me. But while there were other people there, the birds were just not panicked. I realized that there was something going on there. Yeah, that's when it kind of started, my curiosity started. Just it's going to be really there. loud, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where my bird language journey started, really. Hmm. Who was your nearest neighbor in the forest? <laughs> um, human neighbor, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was about 12 houses. The forest I was living in was kind of that shape. And there was kind of 12 houses here. And that's... You know, my nearest neighbor, the biggest neighbor around me was the military base, the base where they store nuclear bombs, which get fitted onto the Trident nuclear missile, missile system. The nuclear deterrent, they call it, for the United Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> were they excited about having you as a neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were really excited. <laughs> they came for lots of visits. <laughs> Because yeah, uh, your your reputation preceded you a bit, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I grew up in a connecting culture, and I didn't really realize when I was growing up that a different life was possible. Um, so I tried to have a job, and it just doesn't suit me. It's, I didn't feel like I was part of, of the solution. I felt I was ticking boxes, and I was being left, and that made me really deeply unhappy, and Eventually, I did leave all of that behind and, and did my best to be part of the solution, you know. And the biggest problem we face on the planet is war, obviously. It's the biggest waste of all sorts of resources, especially human lives and, and well-being, you know, let alone fossil fuels and all that stuff. You know, the destruction it causes is unimaginable. Imagine all of that energy that's being put in there, being put into solutions. I don't think we would be facing any problems, you know. And 
I felt I needed to do something about that as much as I individually could and I went on a journey of peace activism and I trained myself and I joined uh, the, the rich culture of activism in the United Kingdom and I tried to do something you know as much as I could on my own with the help of friends and small groups as possible and I went straight to where I thought you know the, the demon lives if you like <laughs> Right next door, talking to the guards, trying to figure out how to solve this problem that we faced in. And I ended up having permission of the owner of that land to live in that land because she needed somebody to help look after it. And I wanted to live in that land, so that's how I ended up there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they, they played a really important part in my nature connection journey, that military base, in an unexpected way. <laughs> Because they weren't so happy about me being there, with you know my, my reputation, I had been arrested. I forgot how many times I'd been convicted for non-violent peace activism. I'd been to jail twice, and they were obviously really worried. And you know, I signed a pledge and sent it off to the government, saying that I would pledge to peacefully and accountably disarm the nuclear weapon system. <laughs> so obviously, they're going to pay attention to that and to me. Um, but what they did, what they contributed to my learning journey was that they triggered me, they caused me to be trying to be alert all the time because I didn't want to get sneak up upon. So I was always paying attention and that really woke up my senses of what's going on around me. Especially here in Scotland, we don't really need to pay that much attention when we're out in the forest. Because people that want to cause us harm or cause other people harm, they don't hang out in the forest, they hang out in the cities. And there isn't really anything here that wants to kill us, unlike in Australia, where everything wants to kill you. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the worst that can happen is that you twist your ankle or something like that, and you just go to the, the doctors and, you know. So we don't, you know, it's almost an invitation. You know, we've wiped out all the dangerous animals around us, and so we can relax, and yeah, this, that facilitates the disconnection, so it allows us to be more in, in our own mind and in our own... You don't have to pay attention. But I was trying to pay attention all the time, so I was starting to connect to my senses much more. You learned a lot in the forest. For for people who might not have the uh I'm not gonna call it a luxury, it's not a luxury, but uh for, for some people might not have the opportunity to go be chased around by the government in a forest next <laughs> to a <laughs> nuclear military base. <laughs> Where where's the uh like what can they do? Uh, what's the foot of the path? Like, are there are there education resources? Are there books? Are there like who are teachers either active that they can seek out or uh, things that they can absorb to to continue on? And and this is a selfish question because I'm leaving in a few days, and my nature connection journey does not end here. Right, it it really just begins here. Um, so what can I do? Where can I go to continue that in a really deep and rich way wherever I go that's a really big question Tyler <laughs> and it was a question that I was struggling with a lot after I left the forest like you said I in many ways in many ways I'm privileged I'm a white man 20 years ago when I you know 15 years ago you know, I used to joke that I would have to try and force to try and starve myself to death. <laughs> if you're not careful, it would forcibly inject you with food if you're not careful. <laughs> and I didn't have any existing commitments, no mortgages, no debts, no family, no kids to look after, you know, no responsibilities on that level. I was very privileged to be able to go and live in that forest. I was, you know... To, didn't really have to be scared of being assassinated by the United Kingdom government. You know, I have to give them that credit, at least not on their own soil. I wasn't important enough, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a a question that was resolved by me. I mean, I'm lots of gratitude to my girlfriend at the time. She coyote tricked me into <laughs> becoming interested in John Young. John Young is a white Caucasian male in the United States and on the East Coast who has studied with and has been helped by lots of indigenous cultures to 
to rediscover what a connecting culture looks like. And you know, my initial response was, you know, the last thing I need to learn, the last person I need to learn how to reconnect is, is from a white Caucasian male. I need that from an indigenous people. So it's really difficult to try and find you know, a connection to those indigenous cultures directly. And it's not their responsibility either to solve what we white Caucasian males especially have caused, you know, and the problem that we've caused. So that was a bit of a conundrum I was stuck in and John Young solved that issue for me. His path is a bit too long to explain right now, but with the help of lots of indigenous elders and people, um, he created a model distilled out of observations of what all indigenous cultures have in common, the patterns that mm. that they exhibit in their connecting culture. Describing them, investigating what they are like and what they are supposed to be like in, in the, the words of the indigenous cultures themselves and giving them to us as tools to work with and the most powerful tool that is really easy for people to do is it's called a set spot mm. and it basically means just going and sitting in nature and doing nothing <laughs> nothing in a sense of doing you know it's being mm. it's paying attention to all your senses and doing practices to sharpen them and, and you know to hearing to pay attention to the light to you know to the furthest, quietest sound, or you know, paying attention to what's happening in the corners of your eyes, or you know, paying attention to the smell, which is, you know, is so important now. You know, and, and there are lots of routines which are created by John Young and his team that can help us, guide us on that nature connection journey. And it feels a little bit artificial because we're trying to learn something that is already in our DNA and. It's our mind that is trying to stop us from connecting because the disconnection is not real. We are connected. We breathe the air, you know, we eat the food, we eat. The disconnection is in our minds, so we need to recondition our minds and these tools really help to do that. And while you're here, we've, we've paid attention to quite a few of those. Those cultural elements, you mentioned gratitude, that's a really important one. You know? Gratitude helps us to connect to the food we eat when we express gratitude for it. And it helps us to connect to each other and by weaving gratitude for the natural things in there, you know, non-human things like you, the words you use, the non-human things. It helps us to connect to those non-human things by repeatedly doing that and, and feeling that gratitude in our hearts. And other ones is that sit spot exercise and the art of questioning and the story of the day. And I hope you stay part of what I've created in the virtual village, yeah. that group keep sharing those stories and I'm really happy to keep mentoring you in that journey for yourself individually mm. or and we also have a telegram group where we can share those stories by using the disconnecting technology to reconnect ironically but mm. if we're far apart that can help and by reconnecting with you know by, by connecting to local people around you who inspire you to do the same and the beauty of it is that this is a really fast growing network mm. of little hubs of connecting cultures which are connected to each other so you can and I you know trying to remember that the core goal that you're trying to achieve is to try and recondition your mind into from that disconnecting culture into a connecting culture and allowing yourself to make lots of mistakes and knowing that our generation will never really get there. Mm. But we're trying to pretend that we are there <laughs> to try and entice the next generation when they grow up in these connecting cultures and these attributes that the next, you know, we can solve all the problems in one generation if we would all start doing that. Do you know what I mean? So that's the, I think, the best answer I can give. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, It's it's been... You know, I've been here for two months and we share just about every lunch and every dinner. We started with gratitude and we have check-ins and things like that. But uh, we tend to <laughs> uh, make space for each other. When one person's talking, when one person is talking, no one else is talking, we're listening. And then we're not just waiting for that person to finish. They finish 
and then we really try to absorb what it is they say and the first thing that we say is typically not well, some story that I have it's uh, it's a question and that question could be our own curiosity um, or it could be you know a question of um, oh why do you think that is like what do you think that animal eats you know these questions trying to um, sort of like that we've all got this curiosity and these these questions help uh, like support and nurture and like help this curiosity grow and, and, and shape it um, yeah, our conversations around the fire around the meal times are <laughs> hilarious we're just talking about birds and animals and tracking and, and all murder scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and murder scenes yeah we only yeah we only uh, we only get interrupted if an interesting bird call happens and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would love to hear from you why it is that you're going home early mm. and how that came about and yeah what is it that you've taken away from here when you go home mm. so i began traveling in the end of february of this year and i didn't have a strict plan at all i just had a loose idea that i wanted to travel i wanted to help people with cool projects you know, I worked on a fab lab in Portugal and I worked on um, in Morocco helping build a, a mud house and, and other things. And so I thought maybe I'd travel for a year, maybe less, maybe more. Again, not a specific plan, but it was all about sort of practical skills. I wanted to build cool stuff. And so when I came here, that's what I thought I was going to do more of. Um, and I did. I, I built cool stuff. Uh, and it was fun. But I also learned all this about connecting culture i learned some of these routines i've i feel like really begun for the first time my own nature connection journey and i feel like i have learned what i came on my travels to learn without knowing that that's what i came here to learn and so i want to go home because i feel like i'm done with my travels and I want to, as much as I can, take what I've learned here. Because I've got this momentum of two months. I've, I've left this property twice <laughs> in two months. Because there's so much richness here. It's like I don't, I don't I've never felt, uh, you know, compelled to, to, to really leave. So I want to take what I've learned in this momentum that I've got here. And I want to go home to the land where I'm from and begin really rooting down in that place and continuing these practices. And so one of the reasons I don't want to go anywhere else before going home is because I don't want to have to sort of fight the, uh, the inertia of the disconnecting culture by being in it. I, I don't believe in, you know, hermiting away and not being engaged with the world. I do, but, you know, I'm, I'm very new to this and I want to go home so that I can really set some roots there, some core routines and some practices there. Um, before I start start to begin to re-engage a new world. You know, my, my background is in engineering uh, and DIY and, and building things. And so I tend to be really focused. You know, my, my excitement is to, is to build things, make things. Um, and I've been really struggling to figure out how to do that in a way that doesn't make anything worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of a lot of I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to be effective in the world, how to how to participate in the world without accidentally knocking over things in the foyer, so to speak, without causing unintentional harm. And it occurs to me that the more I understand the actual real connections of nature, the relationships between things, the more I have an intuitive understanding of what the birds are talking about, what they're talking about, you know and understand some of the relationships between myself and the natural world, uh, which you just start to get an intuitive grasp of when you start to listen to the birds and realize, oh, they're talking about me right now because I'm being clumsy and making a lot of noise and they're afraid I'm going to hurt them intentionally or otherwise. So I feel like this learning journey is part of my education in how to engage in the world in such a way that doesn't make it worse, A. <laughs> but also it's like, I've been really into thinking about helicopters buzzing around our heads, making lots of noise. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful yeah. timing. Yeah. yeah. Take a breather. Mm. <laughs> I 
that's funny because we'd have a similar problem if we were recording at my at my land with fighter jets and stuff flying overhead. <laughs> I guess it tends to be quicker. So on the one hand, I, I see a sort of instrumental uh, application of this is that it will help me understand the connection of what I'm trying to do in the world in such a way that I won't cause harm to the world and maybe in a way that I can be beneficial to the world by understanding the story of nature. But also, you know, I've, I've been into uh, intrinsic motivation a lot, reading up on it, trying to understand it because I've been very extrinsically motivated for a lot of my life. And uh, sometimes that is appropriate, but when you're out of balance, it doesn't serve you and it doesn't really serve uh, what you're trying to do. And so I just like this stuff. <laughs> just, it's amazing. Um, you know, I don't have to exert any willpower to go out to sit at my sit spot and listen to the birds. I just want to, mm. you know, I, uh, anytime I'm a little uh, bored or I don't know what to do next. My first thought is, ah, maybe I'll just go to my sit spot. <laughs> and, you know, every time I observe something uh, interesting or um, something I don't fully understand yet, well, if I observe something I'm like, ooh, I think I know what that means. I think I know why that bird made that call in that way and then flew over there. That's really gratifying. But also, you know, I'll observe something and I don't know what it means. I'll be like, why did that bird do that? Or what was that bird calling for? You know, and then, and then I just, I'm just thinking about it in a, in a really fun way and uh, coming up with hypotheses. Well, maybe it's this, well, maybe it's that. And maybe, you know, I go to a, to a field guide to read about the behavior and it's like, okay, well, what do they eat? Or, you know, whatever. And <laughs> that rush, if you will, of, uh, of understanding and learning has been really rich. So um, I also just want to do that. You know, uh, it's been a struggle with me actually to keep my, my focus and my attention here and grounded because, you know, I have a really deep connection uh, with the land that I grew up on in California. But now that I, I have had my eyes open and my mind open to what's, you know, there's a story going on there that I haven't known how to read before. And so I just like, I'm so excited to go to my new sit spot, <laughs> wherever it is on the family land, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll be able to track coyote and I'll be able to listen to those birds that I remember seeing that one time. And I'm just really, um, I, I have this excitement and this yearning to go home so that I can begin that rich uh, relationship, you know, with, with the land there. Mm, thank you, Tyler. That's really beautiful. Nature wants to connect with us too, eh? Mm. <laughs> Sit spot is calling you. What are, if I may ask, what are the things that didn't go so well for you, or maybe the the challenges? What was, what was difficult in this journey for you? Mm. One thing that was difficult for me was, you know, at one point you asked me to delegate more. And delegation has always been uh, tricky for me. And at first, I think I told you my stock responses, which were, well, you know, sometimes delegation doesn't, uh, isn't as efficient as you think because then you have to make sure it was done right or, you know, whatever. But upon a little bit more reflection, you know, I realized that I had the sense that, um, you know, engineers, have a reputation as being a bit elitist <laughs> you know they can be like oh they don't want to get their hands dirty they can be a bit arrogant uh, and there's a reason for that stereotype um and i've i'm very conscious of that stereotype and i i think one of the reasons that i'm uncomfortable with delegation is because i'm worried about being seen as arrogant and i'm worried about being seen like i'm too good to do dirty work or you know simple work or something like that um and so you challenged me to do it anyway <laughs> but what you said that was impactful to me was that it's a bit selfish of me i don't remember what your exact words were but what i took from it was that it's a bit selfish of me to to take that stance because 
if I have certain skills and values that can be made in service of a community that I've chosen to serve, then it doesn't make sense for me to do to to not provide as much value as I can. And so if there is things that I can say, hey, can you help with this thing that I could do, but I could also do this other thing that I have the training or the experience or whatever to do. Um, and so you, you challenged me to occupy more appropriate niche and help other people occupy appropriate niches as well. Um, and, you know, it, it for me, it goes deeper than that. Even it goes into, I mean, you talked about traumas from disconnected cultures that goes back to, you know, issues with self-worth and the idea that um, power is something that exists that everyone wants and that can't be ignored. It has to be wielded with some kind of elegance, some kind of grace for the good of the community rather than for selfish ends. Um, so rather than burying it in a dark hole where it's going to fester and probably have bad, you know, consequences, um, you should learn to work with it uh, in a good way. And so I did some work on that and, uh, and I was able to, to delegate and work on feeling like having a good feeling doing it because I felt like I was showing up for the community as well as mm -hmm. I knew how um, and not hiding from you know, myself uh, and not uh, making myself smaller than I, than I really am. Mm. So that, that was, that was one thing that was challenging for me. You know, I, I think some people uh, might be challenged by uh, the amount of clouds and raininess here, <laughs> but I'm from a place that gets 362 days of sunlight and it rains, you know, four days or whatever. So I've just been loving the clouds <laughs> and the rain. I'm just like, it's raining again, guys. <laughs> I've been really grateful for the rain. <laughs> yeah. A number of years ago, I got really interested in uh, eco-villages and intentional communities. And I read a whole stack of books about them. Uh, this is the first place that I've been at that approaches um, you know, a place that's attempting to do anything in that kind of uh, direction, eco-village, intentional village. So I'm familiar from reading about eco-villages, uh, some of the challenges and issues that face these communities. You know, I think one of the books, they say you can expect nine out of ten, you know, communities to fail. And there's a whole lots of reasons, um, you know, one being a lot of people will show up and the same words will mean different things to different people, right? So what does living in community mean? Well, I have a vision in my brain for what that means. So I'll use the word community. You might use the word community, uh, but it means something different for you. And then I do something and you say, that's not community living. And, and then we have conflict, right? But you've spent more time in different kinds of communities. I was struck when I got here of the absence of a lot of the dysfunctions, the kinds of dysfunctions that I had read about. And so I'm wondering what you think about or how you think about how the organizing principles behind what you're doing here and your experiences at previous places. What have you seen not done right? What have you seen that doesn't work? Do you have thoughts on uh, why it doesn't work there and what is going on different here? Yeah, I've tried to live in quite a few d communities before I created this one, because I see that living in community is essential to be, you know, it's an essential part of the solution, if you like, you know, the, the whole of, of the solutions. Um, and for me personally, I've taken all the lessons I've learned about this functionality in these communities to try and prevent them from happening here. And that's hopefully, you know, maybe why you haven't seen the, the common dysfunctions appear here. One issue, for instance, is ownership. That's a really common, a really common problem. Ownership on paper is something that has been invented by colonialists. It allows them to reap the fruits of a piece of land without living on it. Mm. To be able to do that, they had to destroy the old culture here in the the highlands of Scotland, it's called Duchess. It's where the people that live on the land make decisions about the land. That was taken away 
from them by, you know, gradually by the colonialists from down south. And when one person owns the land and the rest of the community is there by goodwill of that person, you create such a power imbalance that it's impossible for the other people to give themselves fully because if as long as they are depending on the goodwill of one person to be here, they feel like they have to hold something back. And they're kind of with their, in the corners of their eyes looking for plan B for a community to be able to function properly. People need to be able to give themselves fully for that community. That's been a real big issue. Um, another issue is that capitalism. And that's kind of a catch-22, really. If your project, if your community starts working really well and becomes more and more popular and desirable for people to... And the value of their property starts rising, the temptation to sell becomes higher mm. because they can buy something really cheap elsewhere, have a lot of money left over. Or if mortgages need to be paid off or loans need to be paid off and people need to start taking on jobs that they don't really want to do and... That kind of leads down a path of selection by whomever has the most money isn't the best way to select people for your community. Quite often it's not, because you start selecting for a higher probability of attracting narcissists or psychopaths into your community, because that's a favourable attribute to be able to gain lots of money. So you're kind of selecting yourself out of success doing that way. Another common problem is that people work with consensus decision-making, with democracy, where one voice is as worth as, as another, and that's not the case. One person who's just arrived in the community, and you know the example I often use is a chef who's been working in that community for 25 years, loves cooking, and is really good at it, and is trusted by the whole community. Their opinion about the amount of salt that needs to go into the food compared to the newcomer I mean, we're not even going to listen or pay attention to what that newcomer is saying. We're going, no, no, just, you know, thank you. <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the leader in the, in the kitchen. That's where this person gets the power to make decisions and gets supported by the rest of the community built on the previous experiences with that. That's expertise. Experts, voices are... And in, in, in a connecting culture, that's the elders. The elders' voices, the people with who are respected and have gained that respect over a long period of time. Um, their voices are worth more, and quite often they are the ones who select the chief of the village. And the chief of the village isn't on top of a pyramidal structure. The chief of the village is part of a circular system where everyone has a role to play, and their role is to support everyone else to play their role fully. You know, it's almost like an the other way around mm. it's supporting mm. upwards training upwards empowering each other and working together so that the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts you know it's the connection between those people the way that they can understand each other non-verbally the way that people can switch roles if they want to so that can there's real accountability and conflict prevention that the connecting culture brings resolves a lot of problems because in a democratic community there is always the possibility to choose not to have to deal with your issues mm. because if you start turning other people against the person you've got an issue with quite often they get bullied away or voted out of the community and that creates this kind of political quagmire if you like that nothing will grow out of really it's a spiral of erosion you know it's a it's a positive feedback loop with negative consequences. You know, a connecting culture needs to create a positive feedback loop where we bring gratitude and cooperation and connection into the community so that it starts traveling around. One of the stereotypes of community are that they spend a lot of time in meetings <laughs> arguing about stuff that doesn't matter that much. Uh, you know, it's like, well, it's consensus, so we need everyone, and we have to deal with this, and we're talking about, like, yeah, what kind of salt to get, or something like that. Just... But, I, so I was struck when I came here, how we didn't spend a whole lot of time in meetings, but I wanted to get your perspective on one of the important meetings that we do have. We have it once a day, 
we do it at lunch right after lunch it's the the self check-in process you've talked about the importance of self-care and how that important that is for the community i was wondering if you could you know what what are your thoughts on that on the check-in yeah once a day we meet to plan the next 24 hours um to coordinate tasks so that we can be as effective and productive as possible mm -hmm. there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of problems coming our way so we can't even hurry <laughs> um we use the principles of deep listening you know the cultural elements of deep listening and, and good message to simplify and speed up and have really good communication but before we go in all of that we ask ourselves the question how are we feeling how are we doing what's going on for us inside of us what's going on with our bodies do we have any aches um what's going on with our emotions do we are we upset are we is there something we need on on any kind of level and we do that before we start doing talking about practical stuff because that is incredibly important because we are our own tools that we use to be in community to build connection between each other and if there's nothing if there's something going on with your tool you want to oil it or you want to sharpen it before you use it and there is no difference between our own bodies and our own well-being we need to be the best we can possibly be before we step into full service of the community and it's we we spend we pay so much attention to that because that is one of the biggest problems with disconnecting culture out there we've been conditioned to be of service to whomever is the boss of us be it our teachers or sometimes our parents or our boss at work or you know ultimately it's the system that we've become servants of you know and it's a system that is designed to extract as much wealth as possible into offshore bank accounts somewhere obscure and we are being mined by that culture to serve that culture and we are taught to disregard our own well-being i'm just recovering from a burnout you know i'm it's easy to talk for me you know even for me it's really difficult to do that so by encouraging that culture of self-care first i'm also healing myself and reconditioning myself to make to pay more attention to what's going on for me i'm kind of forcing myself to model self-care to everyone else so it's a bit of selfishness in there but it's just, it's you know like everything else that's designed here it's a it's a positive feedback loop you know by modeling it and by forcing myself to model it everyone copies me more and i'm bringing it into the culture and everyone starts looking after themselves better and we're just much healthier here as a community because of that principle yeah i, I think a couple of days ago you know we, we kind of checked in and uh, a lot of us were feeling the need to uh do do some self care work and uh, sit spots and hug a tree and you know whatever whatever it was we were each of us needed and and a few of us it said something like okay but uh, you know I'm gonna get my work done and then I'm gonna go to my sit spot and he <laughs> said you invited us all to flip that around and take care of our needs first and then see to the work afterwards that that was the proper order or priority of things yeah I like I like that. So you've spoken a fair amount about uh, indigenous cultures and learning from indigenous cultures. And I'm wondering how you approach learning from indigenous cultures without appropriating, stealing, right, from indigenous cultures. How do we, as people who grow up in the colonizing, you know, world, how do we learn in a way that honors indigenous cultures without appropriation and you know i think for me i i didn't know i didn't have an answer to that question for myself and so i just stayed well away you know from <clears throat> even learning anything about it which with, not consciously i think um i was just i i had a deep fear of uh, being disrespectful of appropriation and so because of that i just i just stayed really far away um which I, I didn't think was a great, you know, <laughs> approach, but I didn't know how to, uh, what else to do about it. It came from that trying not to unintentionally uh, hurt things, destroy things. Um, but you've been really inspired and you've learned a lot from the indigenous cultures. And so w what is the way that we can approach that 
without appropriation? That's a really important question. It's a really important question, Tyler. Thank you. Um, I've always been interested in indigenous cultures. You know, as a teenager and as, as a young adult, I, you know, I, I approached it in what I now know to be a racist, colonial, privileged, white supremacist way. Um, but I've learned along the way that you know that that is a real difficulty. We as white Caucasian people, especially, have destroyed or have tried to wipe them out and try to destroy their culture. And even though in my lifetime I'm not responsible for that, my kind is. Um, once I learned, you know, about cultural appropriation, I realized I had to stay away from them. I did, you know, I stayed away from them. It's not their responsibility to solve our conundrum that we've put ourselves in. And um, the solution that I came across was the, the solution that John Young provided. He had the privilege to be mentored in a very similar way or that other indigenous cultures are mentoring their kids in. So when he became an adult, he realized that he learned so much without them really knowing that he learned so much that he became really interested in how did that happen. He's a really good storyteller. I'm not going to try and tell his stories for him. But he became really interested in anthropology because of that. And he, because he was he displaying those attributes of connection that we've been talking about, the doors opened up for him in those indigenous cultures. And the way that he solved that problem was by not copying and pasting what indigenous cultures are doing, but at looking a, a layer deeper about what he calls the cultural attributes. He traveled around the world and met lots of different indigenous cultures and started building that network of wisdom and found patterns in these indigenous cultures. Let's talk, for instance, about gratitude. He discovered that every indigenous culture has some sort of gratitude, ritual, repetitive habit in their daily existence, expressing gratitude to natural things, to the food that they eat. And it's it's been taken over by a lot of colonial cultures, like Christianity, for instance, hijacked that and made the gratitude directed to Jesus. In indigenous cultures, these this gratitude is directed to whatever is important to us to survive and to nature and to ourselves and each other and to the ancestors and to the land. And by discovering that every indigenous culture has that something like that, you know, there's the next question is like, why are they doing it? And there are two possible answers. One is that it individually evolved out of in every culture individually. So either way, you know, it must be really important because it evolved in all of them. Or the question was the original tribe that we all came from was doing it and everyone kept it going. So it must be really important. The answer is not really possible to determine. We don't have enough data, but it doesn't really matter. Every culture does it. So let's do it ourselves too and try and find our own way of doing that rather than copying and pasting what other indigenous cultures are doing. A, because it would be disrespectful, it's cultural reappropriation. But B, it also wouldn't work because these cultures are all different. They've evolved in the environment that they live in. Mm. We live in a different environment. So what we do here, because we live on a rock, we use rocks as a tool to instead of a talking stick that we hold when we're doing gratitude, we hold a rock because it's a rock that's from this land. Mm -hmm. That's how we created our own model, our own habit. And we learned and we used the cultural attributes that we learned, that John Young and his team learned and passed on to me. So it's kind of the bridge that we created you know, to circumvent that problem. Mm. That, that reminds me of the, the permaculture principle of design from patterns to details. Right. It's yeah. so like taking a specific detail from an indigenous culture, that would be appropriation, but detecting the pattern, the common patterns and saying like, ah, and then so, so going back up that level to the pattern and then uh, establishing a detail that makes sense where you're at, where exactly. that community is at is, is the way to do it. Exactly. I'm going to try and explain it that way next time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I was just parroting a, a, you explaining it that way like a couple days ago. <laughs> um, 
Well, this has been amazing. I don't have any other questions. Uh, it's been a real privilege to talk with you today, but also to uh, have been invited to be here uh, to spend two months of my travels here. <laughs> and uh, I feel incredibly, incredibly uh, fortunate. Uh, and I feel very grateful that my path brought me here um, and that your path brought you here before I got here. <laughs> Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and then as a closing thanks, I really want to pass on your thanks straight to the indigenous peoples, mm. especially the the elders who kept their wisdom alive of their culture. I'm really grateful for them to give permission to John Young to pass on their stories and to harvest the lesson that John got from them. I'm really grateful for your curiosity and your well-being that you brought into the group, that you spiraled around and how you inspired everyone, including me. And yeah, grateful for your contributions here and especially grateful that you want to pass it on because that is one of those cultural attributes. We need to pass on what we learn to the next generation. If you like this podcast and you can read, you probably should subscribe to my email. My website, tylerjdisney.com, is really complimentary to this podcast, and this podcast is complimentary to my website. So if you're into one, you should be into the other, to be honest. Thanks for listening. I'm really grateful that you listened to this episode. <laughs>